This podcast was created by fans for fans and is not affiliated with or sponsored by Hallmark or the Hallmark Channel. This is Eric. This is Sydney. And this is Hallmark Mysteries. And more. All right, everybody, here I am. I do not have Sydney. Sydney is off doing all of her busy August things that we talked about, but I have an amazing guest. Today, we're going to be talking about cozy mystery books that we think would great make great Hallmark movies. And I have the expert on cozy mystery books, Brooke Peterson. Hi, Brooke. How are you doing? Hi, Eric. I'm great. I don't know if I'm the expert, but mm-hmm. I am going to have the so much fun. expert. <laughs> I'm going to have so much fun talking to you about this today. All right, so why don't you tell tell our listeners a little bit about you and why you are the expert. (laughs) All right, well, I am Brooke Peterson, and I'm the author of the Jericho Falls Cozy Mystery Series, as well as The Cameo Secret, which is a middle grade mystery that just recently came out, uh, published by Level Best Books. Um, And I'm also the co-host of Clued In Mystery Podcast, which I do with my friend and fellow mystery author, Sarah M. Steven. Uh, On Clued In Mystery, we cover everything mystery fiction. We're mostly fans, so our topics run the gamut of the the genre. Um, We talk about bios, the history of the genre, the influences, the tropes, the trends. We just like to geek out about mysteries, basically. So we we release a episode every Tuesday, generally, but we are on a short summer hiatus right now. Seems like a lot of people are on the summer hiatus. Yeah, so. we got to we have to do that. We have to take a break. And honestly, our breaks are to read more. I can see it because um, <laughs> you know the commitment of us watching a mystery movie is two hours. Where if you got to get into a book, you've got hours and hours and hours. Yeah. So yeah. You, you got to definitely more commit. I have a question for you though. You said it's a mid grade mystery. Mm-hmm. What what's a mid grade? Meaning it has like more blood and guts in it or something? Uh, middle grade. So like middle grade uh, fiction is for middle grade readers. So like sixth through eighth grade. Oh, readers. okay. Yeah. Not a not like cozy. I thought that was like one step above cozy. So it's for it. yeah, it's young, for younger okay. readers. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Okay. Interesting. So it would fall into the category of a mystery without murder. And you'll see that a lot for some of the YA or, um, you know, books for younger kids that have mysteries in them. So um, we found on the podcast, a lot of people were like, well, we'd like to hear about, you know, we don't want to read even about a murder at all, Uh, not even cozy. Uh, And so these are an option. If you kind of like to get that mystery puzzle, but you don't want to have to read about people dying, you might look at middle grade or YA fiction. Okay. So I'm going back to my childhood. Are we talking like Hardy Boy, Nancy Drew, or like Encyclopedia Brown? So Hardy Boys, Nancy Drew, I would, I would say more so um, because my characters in this book are middle schoolers, but so the way that the publishers categorized it is um, nine year nine-year-old readers and up. So, um, so yeah, they're more intense. It's more intense than a chapter book, like Encyclopedia Brown. It's a little bit more involved than that, but, um, probably nine through 12 year olds would really dig it. I think. Okay. I will say the, uh, um, and I know you talked about this cause I, I listened to it actually episode with the Nancy drew, but when the Hardy boys too, that I, um, remember when I was a kid of getting it and then literally reading it in one day because I and then getting the next one going to the library and just being at the library like checking out three at a time and my mom being like that's all you can take and those (laughs) books were so addictive as a kid and I got through all the Hardy Boys and then I went into the Nancy you know being a boy of course I start with the Hardy Boys and then I went into the Nancy Drews and uh so Yep. Good stuff. I have the All same right. memories. Yep. Good old public libraries. Where would we be without them? Yeah. Well, unfortunately, some places are finding out. Mm-hmm. Which is kind of, kind of sad. All right. Well, let's turn the mood around and not talk about the sad uh, demise of public libraries and talk about our signature cocktail that we like to do. So our signature cocktail is the turn the page martini, which probably is more commonly known as the espresso martini. 
But what you're going to do is going to take your two ounces of vodka. Um, I like Tito's, but some people like Grey Goose or whatever you whatever your choice of vodka is. An ounce of Mr. Black, one ounce of your of cooled espresso, and then you put them all in a shaker and shake it all up, get it nice and chilled. Pour it into a chilled martini glass and then take a couple coffee beans and just put it on top for garnish. And I think that's, as we're talking about books, you know, a little coffee drink with your book seems like a very nice way to spend a afternoon. Now, rather than just drinking a regular old coffee, we're getting uh, loaded while we're reading our books. We may not remember who the who did it, but we'd like to do our cocktail. So there we go. You can read it again and enjoy the story a second time. Exactly. You're like, oh, wait, they did it. All right. Are you ready to go? I am. Okay. Brooke, what is your first book series that you think would make a great Hallmark mystery? So these are going to be in no particular order. Um, but my first pick is The Bake Shop Mysteries. These are um, by Ellie Alexander. And in fact, Ellie has several series that probably would make a good show, but I particularly like the Bake Shop Mysteries. Um, so let me just tell you just a tiny bit about this one. These are set in the charming town of Ashland, Oregon, and this is a real place that actually hosts the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Um, Eric, have you ever been to Ashland? I have not, but I do know it is a real place. I have heard of it. Yeah. So. And I'm not even exaggerating. I think that Hallmark could just load up their gear and truck on over to Ashland and set up and film in Ashland. It is that adorable. It's that cute. It's like every little shop you go into, it's just amazing. It's a great place. So that would be a plus as well. But in this series, we have Juliet Montague Capshaw, Jules for short, and She's come back to her hometown of Ashland to heal her broken heart because she's separated from her husband. His name is Carlos, and there's something shady going on with Carlos. She's not exactly sure what's up, but she's left him. They've been working as chefs on a cruise ship, and she's come back to help um, run her family's artisan bake shop called Tort. Great name for, for a bakery on the Hallmark Channel, I think. And um, so... She's back in town. She's helping her mom, who is really fun. She's a really great mother. They'll have this great mother-daughter chemistry, run the bakery, and of course, mysteries ensue. And there's a lot of tie-in with Shakespeare and things since the festival's happening there. There's a lot of times when actors or directors or things are involved in the story. So that's really fun. Um, but I think especially good is, like I say, that mother-daughter banter, which we really like in our Hallmark movies. Um, there's a love triangle because as I mentioned, Carlos is iffy and, um, Jules high school sweetheart, Thomas really has his eye on her. So we've got the love triangle. We've got the cozy setting, the little cute town recipes, baking. It makes for a great show. Sounds a little like, uh, Hannah Swenson though. It might sound familiar. Yeah. Um, as far as people, actors and actresses that I think would be great in this, I, I really like Elizabeth Lale. She, for Jules, she was the blonde in the first season of You on Netflix. Um, I'd like to see, you know, she played that very, uh, quiet and kind of withdrawn character. I don't know, mysterious character. I think that that gal, she's super cute. And I think she could be like a really fun, outgoing, um, Jules, and then even though this is, he's probably too, he might be the wrong generation. I like Mark Consuelos for Carlos because he's like that Latin guy, right? That's just like super cute. And um, he'd play a great Carlos. Well, he's oh, shady. He's shady. So of course he he's like a little older. He went for the younger woman. And go. so there you go. Right. Okay, good. It, it, help, okay. it helps can, the character. We can, can go with that. that. And, um, you know, he just played Mabel's dad in Only Murders in the Building. So he's got some mystery cred there. And then I love Diane Lane. I've loved her forever. And I think she would make a really great Helen Capshaw. Um, and I think that she could honestly pass for Elizabeth Lale's mom. So those are my, those are my picks. I'd say go big with Diane Lane. I mean, getting her right onto Hallmark. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Let's go Hallmark. So um, I love the casting, especially the uh, Elizabeth Lale. 
is that however you pronounce her name? I watched one season of of you with my wife. She really liked the show. She went through, I think it was three seasons, if I'm not mistaken. She was committed to all of them. I watched the first one and then it's like, okay, I saw it. But I agree with you. I think she um when when I saw you that in the notes, I was like, oh, who is she? And then I looked up and I'm like, oh yes, totally. I, I saw it. So I'll 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 be honest. I read the first uh I think it was like four ish chapters just get a feel for it um and I, I like where you're where you're going but you did you didn't cast a thomas i know i know i don't it, i don't have a good idea for thomas um so. i guess i felt a strong connection i think that um you don't see carlos a bunch in the in the books um you, he's referenced but i think we're gonna have to bring him on screen and so i guess i All just right. I got sidetracked with Carlos. Well, well that, uh, that's the beauty of the Hallmark is if you do look at the books that Hallmark movies are based off of, v often very little of them make it to the actual screen. Like the Curious Caterer, I've, we've talked about that plenty of times. They really just take sort of a scene or just, you know, some characters and then turn it into something. Uh, Hannah Swenson, very similar as well, the last one, carrot cake murder, like it had nothing to do with the actual book carrot cake murder. So you can do, you know, whatever you want. And, you know, we were talking a little bit uh, before we started recording. Really, what we're looking for here is something that has like the bones for a good mystery, a good, you know, you like where the plot's going, you like the characters, you like the setting. And then, you know, the Hallmark screenwriters do with it what they may. And as you, you, you're reading your, your or not reading, but you're saying your your little description there. You made me think that what would be great is getting uh, our friend um, John Jonathan Christian Plummer involved because he his background is Shakespeare, and with the whole Shakespeare fest, like he totally like that's why he's up in upstate New York, I believe, because they have a big festival up there, and that's kind of what drew him there. If I am going off memory correctly, so he, getting him writing this would be fantastic. So. I went and I did a little bit my own casting and because I absolutely love her and I want her to have a lead, JC Dotton, who's in the um, Curious Caters is Marla. Um, she's always plays um, and she's in some other uh, Hallmark movies, but she's always sort of that secondary uh, role. But I thought she would be great to step up because she's just sort of the right age there. She has like a funness to her, um, but I did cast in mine, I did cast a Thomas for me. And once again, I didn't get through the whole book. So you have much better understanding, but I went with a Ryan Pavey because I looked at it and I just found when the little bit that I saw, he just seemed like he's kind of a stoic -y kind of guy. And maybe as, as he progresses, maybe not, maybe Ryan Pavey is terrible, but I would say a lot of our uh, listeners, you could stick Ryan Pavey in anything and they would be happy. So we'll, we'll keep, oh, we'll keep Ryan. That. I think that's a great pick. And I think that he's like kind of the flip side of Carlos, right? So we need the guy that's a little bit more quiet and reserved. And so then you get that great, like, choose between thing. Right, right. Carlos has that fire little whatever. And then you have Ryan Pavey, who's just, and he also looks, just looks like a cop. Um, I don't know if that's an insult or what, we'll say a detective. I guess he's junior detective at this point, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, whatever. Um, Hallmark always has like older people who are just starting their career. So they never get that quite right. And then for um, the mom, I had Terrell Rothberry, who is, she's been in a lot of Hallmark mysteries um, or movies, but she's also probably most known for being in uh, Virgin River. A lot of people know her from there. I just thought like the two of them, um, like you said, I thought I could see them as being a mother daughter. I thought they have a similar enough look to them. Um, I thought they would have some nice banter between the two of them. So that was my picks, for them. but very, very good. And, you know, who doesn't in Hallmark world like the bake shop uh, trope there? So bake shop. Yeah, I don't think we can get enough cupcakes and cookies and, you know, all those goodies. Cupcakes, they make cookies sweeties. and murder. Yep. Yeah, they make beautiful scenes, which Hallmark does better than any, I think, you know, any of the TV shows, like the scenery, they get everything right. And I love, I love to look at a bakery on those shows. I loved in there, the um, because I did get past the murder about the, she's making the raspberry jam 
and that's sort of the raspberry jam mixed with the blood like it just created such a great visual for a little murder scene and i know it's you know cozy and everything so i didn't go into too much detail but i did find that like a really cool way um i don't know if cool way is the right way to put it but i thought it was just really interesting of mixing the two because when she stumbles upon it at first she thinks oh you know it's just raspberry yeah raspberry explosion and then it's like oh no not a raspberry explosion all right all right well my first one i have is and once again mine are in no particular order either um, but it's Piper and Porter Mysteries. And with this one, we have Darby Piper. Um, she comes back to her best friend um, who has a detective agency, wants her to come be a partner with her and help her out and um, comes back and ends up that her friend, Samantha, gets murdered. And so she starts following the case. Um, Samantha is nephew who's a sort of wanderlust guy who she knew back in high school was a little bit older than her but she knew of him but he's been out cruising around the world he comes back and she finds out that um he um actually no they started the they start i take it back i totally messed up they started the detective agency that's why it's called two two chicks detective agency but um and but samantha was the majority owner and so um, the, the, the uh, nephew comes back and after she's dead, he basically inherits her portion. She assumed she would inherit all, but now this guy who she doesn't know, and he's, you know, it, it's not necessarily shady, but he just doesn't seem to have a lot of ambition or interest. And so she's got to go and solve the mystery. And like any good cozy mystery, of course, Darby is the suspect. And so she's got to clear her name as well as solve the mystery. And over the course of time, of course, her and um, the the nephew, whose name is Tate, Tate Porter, um, start getting close and start slowly trusting each other. But they both have their secrets. And um, they end up solving the case together and find out that um, that the... Will said that they end up being equal partners. So the second book, there's two books in the series. The second book, they're more together and they're going out and solving another mystery and they they play off each other. And of course, there's a little bit of sexual tension, but there's no actual real romance for it um, yet. Um, I don't know if there's going to be a third. I hope there is because I really enjoyed the first two. I think it's got a lot of direction to go. I really like the... Um, thing of them being the two detectives uh, versus, you know, when we always have the cop, it's sort of fun when they're outside of the cop um, world. And so that was, like I said, that's my first one. And in here I have, I'm going outside the Hallmark universe like you did. And I have someone who I don't know if anyone's going to know who she is, but Riley Dandy. And I first saw her in a movie called that Samore, which is on Netflix. It's a total rom-com and it's not the best rom-com, I will admit. Um, I downloaded it when I was flying um, to Florida for the in-laws once. And then so I watched it because I never can sleep on planes. And then we had a red eye. So I was watching it at two in the morning. But regardless, I really enjoyed her in it. And so with the character of Darby, she's just very spunky. She runs a lot. She's very energetic. And so as I was trying to figure someone out who could really bring that energy, for some reason, I was just drawn to her and I thought she would be perfect. And then, you know, we talked a little bit about this before when you read some of these books and, you know, with my world being around Hallmark Mysteries, of course, I think casting all the time. But for some reason, when I started going and they first were describing Tate, I just got um, totally stuck on Tyler Hines. And so for the whole time I read it, that's who I thought, because he's mm-hmm. kind of, he's kind of moody. He's a little bad boyish, but at the same time, he's got a charm to him. He's a little scruffy with the beard. He literally was to me, Tyler Hines. So I thought the two of them, and we all want Tyler in a mystery. So I thought this would be a perfect platform to, uh, to bring him on. So I had the two of them being together in this, uh, in this mystery. I really like those picks, Eric. You are good at this because I think that 
that sounds like a great pair up. And um, I like the concept of the PI story because, um, you know, we can all talk about the trouble we run into of trying to get an amateur sleuth. Like, how do they keep stumbling over right. crimes or dead bodies or whatever? But when you put the PI um, or the detective agency into the mix, then everything gets easier and they get hired to do things. And sometimes they work on cases they're not hired to do. But um, yeah, it really makes us a series easy to maintain, I think. So I love that. And it also, you know, like you said, in the second book of these, that's what exactly what happens is they get hired to um, there's there's a murder at this resort and they get hired to, you know, investigate it. So there, as you said, there's a reason they're there. But the other thing is they're not the cop. So one of the things, and you being a writer of these mysteries is something you have to deal with, is we're in a cozy mystery land. So it's not always about the right rules and regulations of law, but you don't have to necessarily do that. So when you do have someone like sneaking in and going somewhere they're not supposed to, a private eye is allowed essentially kind of to do it, whereas a cop can't really go in that without a warrant, you know, they've got all the rules that they have to follow. So yeah, I yeah. think the, the PI aspect of it does give it a little bit of, you know, not that we always need the reality, you know, it does give it a little bit of that reality. What's all your right. next one? Yeah, my next pick, I am sticking with sweets, another for another choice. We, um, I'm recommending the ice cream parlor mysteries. Uh, these are by Abby Colette. And um, I will admit, I have not read a lot of these books. I have read book one and I know that they're really, really popular. And I think that this concept is great for a TV show. Um, so in this one, we also have a, another real life town. Um, in this one, Bronwyn Wynn Crucy is a recent MBA grad and she's come back home to run her family's ice cream shop in Chagrin Falls, Ohio. So Chagrin Falls? Chagrin Falls, yes. Um, apparently the shop has kind of fallen away from its original intent and, you know, grandma and grandpa's recipes aren't being used anymore and it's kind of in disrepair. And so when decides I'm moving back home, I have this MBA, I'm going to bring back the ice cream shop to all its glory. So that's kind of the backdrop of what's going on. We've got a tourist town. So we're going to have easily these like, you know, different characters that come in and out of town. So you might be able to um, create some, some, um, crimes and some different suspects that way and um she also has a lot of family drama because it's multi-generational so she's got aunts and uncles and grandparents and um close friends so i think that that works really well to to bring in some of the tension so she's got her business tension she's got the family and friends kind of tension and then somebody drops dead so you got to solve the mystery but um i love the multi-generational generational cast, like I said. Um, it's also a diverse cast. And I think that that's something that would be really great for Hallmark to have more people of color, color be your stars. And this would give them the opportunity in this show. And um, then I love the small town, the small tourist town. And my pick for the um, sleuth in this one to be Wynn Crucy is Quinta Brunson. She's the star of an Abbott Elementary. And I going big again. I am. I'm just going for it. I love her. She is amazing. I think that she is my new favorite actress. She's so funny. She's so adorable. And I think that that's um, for um, Abby's um, series. You really need like this person is spunky and funny and great. And she's going to have a ton of banter with her grandma and grandpa. I think with her, one of the, her best things is she's really good at the nonverbal comedy, like her, some of her faces, the looks she can make during Abbott Elementary was just like, she doesn't have to say a word and you just laugh or smile and things. Yeah. So based on what you're saying, it seems like, yeah, that would be a, a, a great character. And you're saying the multi-generational, you know, makes me go back to one of the things I really like about Hannah Swenson or Murder, She Baked is it does have the different, you know, there, there, there's the mom, there's Hannah, her sisters, it's the whole yeah. kit and caboodle. So you have your whole mystery with it, but then you have that side, which I think is a lot of fun. And a lot of people actually, I think like that as much as they like the, the mysteries 
that are you know taking place so and a nice cream shop is a nice little twist right yeah uh, yeah, they like the characters are Pop Pop and Grandma K and Maisie. Like you just feel like it's really homey and cozy. Now are they called like the Rocky Road, whatever murder or something? Like do they all have the ice cream name? They have super punny names. Each book has the most punny names. Um, Game of Game of Cones is one of them. Right. You know, they're really, she has done a great job titling them. They're, they're just adorable and, and ripe for the picking. All right. I'll have to give that a go when I get done with uh, the next one of yours that we're going to talk about, but I, I do have to get into one of mine first. And this is the Frankie Amato mysteries. Um, I believe you said that you've heard of them. You haven't gotten to read them. She's won some awards for this. These are written by Tracy Adred, Adridi Jetty. I don't know. It's a big Italian name that I can't pronounce. Um, it's got a lot of Italian heritage to it. But once again, going into um, Hallmark World, I don't know if you need, necessarily need to keep that, but it does have a lot of the same thing you were just talking about, generational. So in this one, you've got Frankie, who is a, a police, working for the police in I think Austin or somewhere Houston, somewhere in Texas. And she finds out that her boyfriend, she does this bust and she finds out that her boyfriend is cheating on her with this like six foot three transgendered prostitute. And which obviously, I don't know if that quite would make Hallmark the the beginning, but she's like busting him up. And this woman ends up like totally beating her up. And her detective is, instead of saving her, he's an older guy who doesn't think women should be on the force and just is very, very demeaning. He's like, as soon as they break in there and they see that her boyfriend and this 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 German prostitute, he's like, oh, hang on. I had a really bad burrito. I'm going to go use the bathroom. You can deal with this. <laughs> and so he's in the bathroom while she's getting beat up by by this uh, this behemoth uh, woman, trans, transgendered one. And so she's like, you know what? I'm out of here. My, I don't like being in the police force. I'm not getting any respect. Um, my boyfriend's cheating on me. So her best friend from college has a detective agency back in, I just realized there's a theme to what I have going on here, but um, back in New Orleans. And she's been trying to say, hey, come on out, you know, come be my partner, work for me. I'd really love to have you. Business is booming. So she packs it up and just goes I'm out of here and moves to New Orleans and she ends up joining this detective agency and um, on there, she uh, gets moved into this little, little apartment that this former burlesque dancer, who is an absolute hoot of a character because she's a woman who's like in her sixties, but still wears like essentially lingerie and high heels around everywhere with a big cigarette with a big holder and just these great characters. It's got all these great New Orleans characters in there. It talks all about, you know, a lot of the, 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 um, the, the, the Creole and Cajun stuff that takes place. In it as well, she's a woman who's in the book nearing her. She's like 29 years old, but her grandmother's like, you should be married because, you know, women who are not, you know, 21, you're essentially an old maid. You're never going to get married if you can't get married. So her grandmother, even though she's in Houston is or Austin, wherever they're in Texas, is still meddling, trying to do stuff. And so she's got her friends in New Orleans who's setting her up with all these like this terrible blind dates and, uh, But she ends up going through and being a detective and going through, she's just got one of the things that I thought in the book I did not enjoy is there's a fine balance between someone being like a hot mess and it being entertaining and adding to the character. And then it just being like, oh my God, you just annoy me. No one would be your friend. There's like a, a, a fine line. And I think it went too far in my opinion that I just sometimes couldn't get past, but regardless I think in a Hallmark, if we, you know, in the screenwriting, we could sort of tone it down, but just have that sort of character who is a hot mess in her personal life. She's trying to figure things out, but it's just, she's always getting in her own way. Um, She ends up falling for the handsome banker 
who, um, of course, she gets jealous because in one of the, I think it's the second book, because he's got a beautiful assistant. So she like follows him and ends up uh, like accidentally running him off the side of the road because of some, you know, accident, but she's that kind of thing. And um, so, but you say there's all these different mysteries and it takes place in New Orleans, which is a great location. And it really builds a lot in that New Orleans into there. And as we said, it's got that multi-generational, even though they're far away, she calls home and all the time and they do other things like that. So it's just a fun mystery. I think it would need to be reworked in my opinion, because it, um, it does, like I say, her character is just a little too much in my opinion, unsympathetic with her problems that she creates for herself. So, um, but in general, great fun mystery that I think would be able to make a lot of episodes in a Hallmark, because that's one of the things too you want, right? There are characters and enough different scenarios that you can keep it going. And as we just discussed, and I didn't even really think about that until I was halfway through talking about this, of being once again, the detective. So they once again, do have the reason for investigating and doing these things. Um, the other thing that like annoyed me about it is in the in the books, every time she sort of figures out who it is, but then she ends up getting in a predicament where she's about to essentially be killed by the killer. And then somebody has to come save her because she messes it up. Like the first time I was like, oh, it's great. But then they do it again and they do it again. And I'm like, well, at some point, you're not going to have someone who just coincidentally you know, there to, to save you. So to me, whatever nitpicky, but in our Hallmark world that would get written out and she would be a little bit better at closing the deal. So for my casting, you know, I had last time going Tyler, which was in the, you know, the Hallmark world going big, I'm going equally big for my female lead here. And I've got Kimberly Sustad. And the reason why she's a little bit older than the character, but we can do that. Whatever. We just take her out of her, you know, late twenties and put her into her mid thirties. Fine. So be it. But Kimberly just is the one who can, I think, bring that co comedic touch to it that can walk that line and do it in such a wonderful way that everybody loves Kimberly Susta. I don't think there's a person on this planet who doesn't just love her. And like I say, she can, I think her doing that hot mess character, she would know how to do that perfectly. And it wouldn't be annoying. It would be where you look at it and you would just laugh and you'd enjoy it and and at the same time, I think she has enough where she could also then bring the the mystery through it and would be perfect. She's, I think she's just built for sleuthing. And then like you're talking about trying to have some diversity. Um, have you ever seen uh, Zoe's Extraordinary Adventure or Playlist? It was on a few years ago. I think there was two seasons. She like had some accident and would hear like everybody would sing their personal thoughts I think that I did watch like a couple of the early episodes. Yeah. Super so, funny. So really on, fresh concept. On their on that show, there was sort of her, it had their, its love triangle, but her work love interest with the, the head of marketing was this uh, fellow named John Clarence Stewart. And he's uh he's a black guy. And so I thought, you know, once again, being down in New Orleans, we definitely should be having some color to be reflective of the 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 community. And just as we said, also Hallmark, we need it. And they've been embracing diversity. So this would be great. And so he, and he's also not hard on the eyes, which we always like in our leading men, right? So he's a really good looking guy. He's supposed to be a banker. I think he's, you know, he was always as the head of marketing. He was always in some really nice tailored suits. And so I think he could pull that look off as Bradley, who's the, uh, the head of the, uh, the the bank, the local bank there, the Pontchartrain Bank or something like that. I, f I forget what it was actually called. And then for her sidekick um, who brings her over is um, Jacqueline Collier and who is always, she's in like a ton of stuff and she's never been the lead. Um, I'm not casting her as a lead here, but she's just funny. She's, I think, would be perfect between the, the the banter of the two. I think just having two people who really know how to do comedy would be fantastic because I think that's what this mystery would be. It's kind of like doing the earlier this year, we had the cases of mystery lane, which had a great mystery, but it had a wonderful comedic element to it. I think this could be one that's along those lines and just be a really fun comedic 
mystery that we'd really, really enjoy that has all those elements and having some great stars. I would watch that, Eric. This sounds like a fun show. Um, And speaking of fun titles, each of these are named after a cocktail, which right. you gotta love that too, right? Yes, very much so. Which is funny because they don't really, the cocktails don't really play too much into it, but so be it. It is, like you say, it is great. And how she's cranked out what eight of them. And I think there's one, another one coming out later this year. And, you know, how she can keep these titles. And I guess, you know, you writers are kind of uh, creative, but how she keeps cranking them out and stuff. So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty good. All right. Your next one I have given a go to. And so I'm excited to talk about this one. Me too. This is. The Sherlock Holmes Bookshop Mysteries by Vicki Delaney. And um, so this one is going to feature a little bit older of a sleuth. This is um, Gemma Doyle is our sleuth. She's a transplanted English woman who has come to West London, Cape Cod to manage her Uncle Arthur's Sherlock Holmes bookshop. So you've probably already started to see the little Easter eggs. We have Uncle Arthur. She's Gemma Doyle. Um, Vicki Delaney does an amazing job of just sprinkling in all this Sherlock Holmes, all these little details that are fun. They don't you don't have to be a big Sherlock Holmes fan to still enjoy the stories and the characters. But if you are, then it just kind of adds that extra something. But so she's come back to run Uncle Arthur's elderly. So Gemma's come back to run the shop for him. And this is a shop that specializes in the Holmes Canon and pastiche and is also home to Moriarty the cat. There again, Moriarty. Uh, yeah, she, Moriarty does not belong to them. He lives in the bookshop. That's his house. He's not anyone's pet. Thank you very much. It's it's just a really cute relationship there too. And um, in the first one, which she finds a rare and potentially valuable magazine um, that contains the very first Sherlock Holmes story hidden in her bookshop. It's not part of her inventory. Someone has stashed it there because it's like one of those things like, where do you hide something Sherlock Holmes? Well, in the Sherlock Holmes bookshop, because it will just fit right in. So they try to find who has hidden this here and who owns this. And it's potentially worth, you know, millions. Um, and along the line, she and her friend Jane, who runs the adjoining Mrs. Hudson's tea room, um, they set off to find the owner and stumble upon a dead body. And so then it turns into a murder investigation. But the shop is absolutely adorable. The way she describes it, I thought for sure, like, oh, this place has to exist. Like, it feels that real. So I started looking it up because I'm like, maybe I need to schedule a trip. I want to go here. But no, it's fictional. Vicki Delaney just has made it seem that amazing. And um, and there are nine books in the series. So lots of material to work through. Gemma is, um, has an on again, off again relationship with the detective. They kind of, they kind of date and then they don't date and then they get angry with each other because they date other people. And so then they date again and they've got that kind of a relationship. And Jane and Gemma are that opposites. Um, Gemma is very black and white, you know, business owner. And then Jane is the foil where she's much more um, creative and she runs the bakery side of things. So that's a really fun and they're each other's, um, Sherlock and Watson, you know, so we've got that happening. Um, for my picks for Gemma, I have, I, I wanted an English, um, actress because she's an English woman who's now living in the States. And so I picked Rachel Sterling. She's one of the actresses who was in Bletchley Circle, which was a period drama that I really loved. And she's, she's really, where, where, where can you see that? Cause I've never heard of it. Um, so I think you can watch, I watched it on Netflix. Okay. Um, so it's one of those, um, World War II, um, dramas where, and, they, it is like mystery in a sense, because they are women who are working at Bletchley Circle during World War II, who are doing like the spy work. And um, so it's a spy. It's a spy drama. Oh, great. But she's really beautiful. But she's also like that um, very intelligent looking, right? She's not like glamorous. She's just this beautiful woman. And I, I see her as Gemma. 
so for the sidekick, um, Jane Wilson, I'm, I'm going to go a little bit off script of the book because Jane is not this silly or comedic, but I just think it would be such a fun addition to the story if um, if Jane was just more quirky. And so I'm going with another one of my favorite actresses. I'm going big, Eric. And that's A.D. Bryant, who you will know from SNL. She is one of my favorite all-time actresses. I think she is amazing. And I just think I could just see her as being kind of, um, you know, clumsy. Maybe she's like, having baking mishaps next door and it would just add a just a totally fun element to this to this series love it which is once again the the beauty of the hallmark rewrite because in the book at least from where i got um she's supposed to be like super petite and like seems very not prim and proper but definitely knows her big like she used to have a bakery in boston so mm -hmm. i like your twist on it better of giving her like somebody who's a little more of that fun because as you're saying like Gemma is a very black and white like mm -hmm. there and having that sidekick who she does at least from the part where I got to she definitely does seem to be a little bit lighter yeah but I like yours of definitely being like the other the yin yang kind of thing I love that idea yeah I think it would be super fun so for mine and I, I said before how sometimes I just get this picture in my head I got an idea always don't know if I pronounce her name right, but I went with a Rachel myself, a British Rachel, but Rachel Scarston, who she was in the Royal Nanny of, uh, which was on last year in the, in the Christmas uh, movies, which I, in my pre picks, I think I had that as my least favorite movie I was looking forward to. And then when I watched it, I thought she was so, the whole movie I thought was just so charming and she was so good that I just loved it. And it ended up being a top 10 movie for me from the whole thing. And I've just wanted her in a, um, a mystery. And so when I was listening to this, and by the way, I listened to an audiobook. I was going through and I was like, oh my God, I really like this. And I was really liking it. And then when they said, oh, the cat's Moriarty, um, I, I'm walking my dogs and I was literally just laughed out loud. I'm like, I know. Perfect. This is perfect. Yeah. And um, when I was reading the reviews, a lot of the, it was, you know, there were, most of them were positive and the negatives were that Gemma and you've, you've gotten through more was Gemma is just too, like a lot of people are saying she's unlikable because she's just too, you know, without filter. And I was talking, I was listening to it. Um, I went grocery shopping and I dragged my daughter with me this morning to go grocery shopping. And she's like, well, she's just British. That's how um, her aunt's British and it's just like, they're, they're, I don't want to say they're different, but it's just, she's British. Right. And so I think it goes within the character and I actually like that. And, um, I think it, as you're talking about the, the similarities with the, the, uh, the, uh, Sherlock Holmes, um, yeah. there, I think yeah, it, just, it fits. She's kind of a spinoff of the Sherlock character who right. is not likable at all. If you know, if you've read any Sherlock Holmes, he is abrasive and he's kind of a jerk, but he's like always right. You know, he, right. he's the one that figures it out. And Vicki Delaney didn't take her that far, but you do have that feeling where she's a little standoffish. She's not warm and fuzzy. Um, and I've, I'm at the beginning. I haven't read deep into the series, so I don't know if she softens up over time, but, um, yeah, it's, it is intentional, but I can see how it's, she's maybe not and, someone's favorite sleuth. But I, like I said, I liked it. And like you said, it is intentional because it is Sherlock Holmes ask, and there's a lot of that similarity. And then, so I, that's what I had for, for her. And then for the sidekick, I had two different, two different choices. I couldn't, I couldn't figure out who I wanted. I had Chelsea Hobbs and kind of along the same lines as you, as I just thought Chelsea who um, she was just in, I think it was Dance Moms, if I'm, or I forget what it was called. It was the earlier Hallmark one. She was also um, the sister in The Holiday Sitter last year. Um, I, I, I think she's adorable. And I thought she just kind of fit for me. But then I also had Kiki Palmer, who was from Scream Queens. And once again, getting back into the thing of trying to add some diversity to it. And um, so between the two of them, they, they kind of the same, same thing. I, but I have to say, I think I like your direction better. 
I like go, Heath uh, too. I would be really happy. I think that is a would be a good pick because you're I, getting that same idea where because she's you know a very fun and like big personality, and I think that would be the the yin yang thing, like you said. Yeah, but uh, no, I I like yours, so we'll, we'll swap. So, we'll hope uh, that Hallmark can get her. Yes. Um. Okay. Moving on to my next one. It's a book you may be familiar with. <laughs> but it's called the uh, Jericho Falls Cozy Mystery Series. The author is uh, Brooke pa Patter Peter Peterson. I, I can't ever get that <laughs> name right. Maybe you can help me with that. Brooke Peterson, um, you. And um, I gave it a go. And I have to say the main character um, is Chloe Martin. Really liked her. Um, she's just, she's got some issues. So she's this one who her grandma Lily tricks to come back. I I feel bad like describing it, considering this is your baby, and I'll like say something you're like I can't no, wait to hear you describe no, it. That's not it at all. <laughs> Did you not understand what I was saying? But Chloe Martin is up in um I think Boise, right? It's Idaho, Boise. I believe it's Boise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And she, her mom, her grandmother gives her a thing saying, oh, I'm sick. I'm about to die. You got to come back. She's always been very close to her grandmother. She would spend her summers in Jericho Falls, um, which is Nevada. I don't know where. And is it like upstate Nevada or something like that? Or Reno-ish? Or is it's it a real place? No, it's not a real place. Okay. But it's kind of based on a real place near Reno. Okay. That's why I, I envisioned it being like, kind of like that. And so she cruises back to the small town. She gets back and her grandmother's like, well, maybe I'm not sick. And so she's like, oh, I can't believe I dropped everything just to come back and you're not sick. Um, but the grandma just wanted her back for reasons we don't know yet. Um, through the first, I've been through the first two. Um, but then her grandmother's dating a, a guy. And so uh, Chloe's like, oh, I'm not so sure about this guy, but she seemed to make her happy. And then lo and behold, he dies. And uh, so it's about finding that whole mystery. But one of the reasons why uh, Chloe left Jericho Falls, which is a place where she'd come every summer and she really enjoyed was her best friend. I believe they were 16, um, mm -hmm. had an accident and she died. Um, and there was suspicion about it. And Chloe was the main suspect all the way up until like basically I, I don't think she went it didn't go to trial right but it got close like she was very far along and so she has very it like sort of ruined the whole thing you know she lost her best friend and then the whole charm of this place her magical place was ruined so she just left swearing never to come back and it wasn't until her uh her grandmother uh said she was sick and that she came back but then, you know on the way back and she um, meets Officer Garner through a very interesting. Um, what, it wasn't a taquito. What would it? Would she burrito? What would she? Corn dog. Corn dog. Yeah, she ate a corn dog that had a little rumbly in the tumbly, and she was speeding <laughs> to find the next bathroom. And Officer Gardner, we meet, um, who's a dreamy police officer. Imagine that in a cozy mystery. Pulls her over, and she tells him what's going on. So he gives her a police escort to the bathroom. But like I said. Uh, she's there and she becomes the number one suspect in the death of this gentleman who her grandmother was dating, who they find she finds dead. And lo and behold, the detective who's first investigating it is the little sister of her best friend who had died. And her little sister still thinks Ellie, Ellie, um, Porter thinks that maybe Chloe really was part responsible for it. So she didn't believe that she got off. So that created a little bit of drama. So it's all the shenanigans of proving that Lily, her grandmother is innocent. And then going through all the different characters. Um, as I told Brooke, I totally thought I nailed it, <laughs> but I nailed the concept, but the wrong person and very fun. Um, the, then you move on to this, the second mystery is where she's really not involved, but she stumbles upon it and, um, decides she wants to help solve it. Well, not help solve it. She decides she wants to solve it because as she's investigating it, there's a lot of, uh, entanglement with the old, um, case of what, why am I going brain dead on her 
best friend's name? Uh, Christy. Christy, right. Uh, Christy's death and this current murder. So um, she gets sort of involved in that and bringing some of her old, her old high school uh, romantic interest involved, who's now the mayor. Um, so mm-hmm. it's just a lot of fun. Um, the character, the thing I really like about it is kind of like what I liked about Darby in that um, first one I was talking about the, uh, why am I going brain dead on the, the Porter, um, Piper and Porter. Piper and Porter. Yeah. Darby, Darby Piper is she just a very spunky character is mm-hmm. what I liked about her. Um, she's also is not why well, she's like, I say spunky and fun. She also has some emotional baggage that she's dealing with through here. And so sometimes as I was talking to you, I get a little frustrated with her. But then I remind myself, like, she's carrying a pretty heavy weight and, you know, and she, and I, I love what you did in there. Um, in the second book, you, you bring it out and you say where she acknowledges essentially she kind of got stuck emotionally at 16 and, you know, started shutting off people. And, you know, it just really explains a lot of some of those frustrations of her character because you're like, you're getting in your own way, kind of where I was talking about um, earlier with Frankie, but Frankie, whatever, I think that's just her her personality. Whereas here, you really did do a good job, I think, of explaining why she's getting in her own way. And despite it being frustrating, you constantly have that in the back of your mind. So, um, but it's just a fun one. You know, it's the cozy mystery in the little town. Um, Aunt Lily or Grandma Lily, excuse me, she has a big old mansion from the back in the original days of when the, when the uh, town was founded. And so people come and do tours there. And so they're really ingrained in the community. And it's got all that small charm, small town charm things where they, you know, have the big events and everybody knows everybody and they come to the events. And so it's all that kind of stuff that you want in a, um, in a, uh, a little cozy mystery. Um, one of the things I was reading um as i was prepping for this was and i stumbled upon it by accident but it was like the elements of a good cozy mystery and it's like you're supposed to have five suspect characters and i like the way that when you when you did it you sort of the first one is like their inner circle and then the second one gets to the trailer park circle and you know some of the other people but it brings it in and um i think with with the town and the way it's set up is you do have that ability um, to keep going. Um, one of the things it does have a slight love triangle, but not really, because mm-hmm. her old high school boyfriend um, is there, but she's not interested in him anymore. But people think she should be, and I think he, though it's not really expressed, I think he's still interested in her she sounds by the way and this could just be my own thing she sounds like a very cute girl so she's um obviously i think rather attractive so of course uh he's going to be still interested in her because he's still single but then there's chief garner and then there's that you know tension will Mm -hmm. they won't they that you that you gotta have um, you know, we talked about it before. He's the detec- he's the detective, the police chief, and she's the 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 Snoopy nosy body. So there's that little tension as well. That it's it's very funny, and it's in it's in the co- cozy mystery thing about how they can be professionally like shouldn't you know I don't like you, but then personally I do like you. Mm-hmm. So they, they clearly have eyes for each other, but then. When as soon as they get into a case, then they're like, you know, I don't, I don't trust you. You are getting in the way, and they have right. all that stuff, which is, you know, cozy mystery one on one, which you got to have. So, very enjoyable. All right, what did I? What What do you think? What do you think I missed? What it obviously I was very all over the place, but. Um, well, I'm beaming. I just think that was so enjoyable to hear you tell the, you know, in a nutshell, book one's premise because. I think that you, you've got it. And whenever I hear somebody um, like express that they get the, per- like, yes, Chloe is frustrating. She's frustrating for me to write because I'm like, get with it, girl. Why do you keep stubbing your toe on this same thing? Um, 
but to hear that you kind of got like the nuance and the background of things that just, it just makes me super happy. That's all I can say. And I'm beyond happy that you would think that this would make a good Hallmark show. I just, I'm, I'm beaming. Good. I think one of the things too, and bring a little bit of my personal baggage along with it is I lost my best friend. He, he died in a car crash. Um, when I was, let's see, I was 18, I think it was my freshman after my, um, excuse me, after my sophomore year, so I was 19 after my sophomore year of college. And, um, I just remember I went through a very similar thing where you have that survivor. Now, granted, I was in Arizona. He was in Tennessee. He was at a, uh, he was, um, doing a counselor at a camp and mm-hmm. it was out in, out in, out in the Smokies. And there was a thing in the, where they sort of went off a cliff, um, in air and everyone in the car died. So I wasn't even there. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing was he was supposed to be out. My other really good friend had come out for the summer and I, he was supposed to come too. And he got this last minute thing at the camp that he really wanted to do. Cause he liked, he loved, you know, hanging out and, and counseling kids and stuff. So he decided he was going to do that. And so I just felt this guilt. And so I went through a pretty long period of time where I also couldn't connect to people. I really shut off. Um, just, I, I don't want to say I was like suicidal by any means, but I was just like, what's, what's the point, you know? Mm-hmm. And you make just really bad decisions because you're like, you know, whatever it's, it's it all doesn't make sense. You know, I can just die tomorrow who, you know, who cares? And so I may have had a little bit more, even though, like you say, she's frustrating and, Yes, she's stubbing her toes and you just want, you know, her just to get get her act together. Because for us being voyeurs of it, we see it all, right? And you can see, you're like, ah, but when you're in it, you just, you don't, you don't see with that clarity. So um, I think I kind of related a little bit. Now, granted, I was not in the circumstance that Chloe was where she was with her and gotten in a fight, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and off the off she ran and you know accidentally fell off uh the waterfall and you know and died and all of that so but i still felt a little bit the same because you know he was supposed to be with me and wasn't she was if she hadn't gotten the fight she'd remembered the bathing suit which we learned was not really the case but um of why she was upset but uh so yeah so i just relate a little bit so all right Let's get back to a positive thing and get into a little bit of my uh, casting for this. So I'm going to go a little bit backwards. So even though Chloe's the main character, I'm going to start with the back with um, Chief Gardner, Chief Lance Gardner, because as I told you, when I was reading this book, I literally from the first time he pulled her over and your description of him walking up in the place, um, pulling over for the, you know, the corn dog indigestion. <laughs> I just immediately went and I could not get him out of my head, Travis Van Winkle. And he, the entire series, he just completely is him. And I could not do a scene without it being him. So I have to go there because if Hallmark makes this and they do not cast him, I will throw the biggest hissy fit though. <laughs> By the time movies happen, well, actually movies do happen fairly quickly. Um, they uh i don't as say travis may be too old but we'll, we'll we'll make this happen real quick so by by next uh, spring this will be a spring mystery on hallmark but travis is he is the character i would um, agree with you eric because i've had the hardest time you know people want to say who would you cast you know as your i've had the hardest time with garner but you nailed it you nailed it that's him that's him mm-hmm. perfect now um why well, we digress a little bit when you are writing these characters um obviously you're writing with no real intention that hey it's going to become this movie and thing but do you as you're writing them in your head do you formulate like did somebody stick out to you like as you're writing it like oh this is somebody in the kind of little personality ish or description ish base it off a real life person some of them i definitely have and i and i tend to grab it to it gravitate towards actors just because we have seen them right we've seen them in things right. so sometimes I'll have someone in my head um 
Oh, I'm going to tell you who Grandma Lily is in a minute, but I've lost her name all of a sudden. But um, but I feel like with some of them, it's just my own imagination. Like I couldn't nail him, and he's one of them. I couldn't. I know what he looks like in my head, and this is a pretty dang good rendition. That's good. Uh-huh. Um, my my Chloe in my head is um Zoe Deutsch. Okay. So she's a little quirky, but she's still like she's super beautiful, but she's not. Like I said before, she's not glamorous, beautiful. She's t-shirt and jeans, pull my hair in a ponytail and, you know, girl next door, beautiful. So So for my Chloe, I had Kim Matula. And if you uh, watched anything about me last uh, Christmas, you'll know my favorite uh, holiday movie last year was Ghost of Christmas Always. And she was the lead in that. Um, She's beyond adorable. And in that movie, I kind of... Like she looked very cute. She did not look, I don't think, stunning, beautiful. But then when you actually look at pictures of her, she's stunning, beautiful. But for me, when I was reading it, I just needed somebody who could, who I thought would just be, like you kind of said, a girl in jeans, putting her hair in the ponytail, getting the, you know, the hands dirty. She drives her pickup truck. And Kim Matula just, seem like that where she's really pretty but at the same time can be not this was, i don't know how to say it like not intimidatingly beautiful mm-hmm. just just pretty and so that's kind of and as i told you when you're just when throughout the book that's just kind of the thing i had to sort of this effortlessly pretty pretty yeah. woman i right? like her i like her i wouldn't i wouldn't hate that so and so yeah so that's who i had and as, as I told you with, with this book, because I did like the character so much, I just really wanted it to be somebody cast, somebody who I had a personal connection with. And I, like I said, since that was my favorite, that's actually maybe my all time favorite Hallmark holiday movie. Um, so I just really it sort of like had that like special place that I was holding on to that. I was like, okay, this is worthy of her. So Aww, I have that. Thank you. And now, because we are in Hallmark world, I, I went two, to dra- two directions, but my real casting I would do if I was the Hallmark producer and doing this is I would change Grandma Lily to be her mom, mm-hmm. and I would make it be Dana Delaney. And Dana Delaney, I will be totally candid and honest, before there was Brooke Burns, there was Dana Delaney. In college, Dana was my pin password for all of my, <laughs> my things. China Beach. I hated the show, but I would watch it without volume just so I could watch Dana Delaney. Um, I think Body of Evidence she was in. I love Dana Delaney. I had for 20 years an unhealthy obsession with Dana Delaney. So um, I just thought Grandma Lily, um, because when you describe her, how she's in the book, she's 74. Five, I think 70s yeah. but we she's still mm-hmm. she's still you know very youthful and Dan Delaney is sort of the one who she's in her late 60s so she's not too far off mm-hmm. that age but I just couldn't see her as a grandmother person like she doesn't have grandmothery on her but I think she has sassy mom and then Kim Matula also she's a little bit older than Chloe so she needs a mom who would her grandmother you know couldn't be would be 40 years older so that'd be too real quick um you know young which you know can happen but I just recast it and I went with Dana Delaney and because I would love to see Dana, Dana Delaney and something again but if I did go with grandma Lily and which is funny because I think they're only like two years apart but it just shows you, I guess, how somebody could probably pull it off versus like, I don't think Dan Delaney could pull off grandmother, but Mary Steenburgen, who oh, I, love her. I, I, I thought she could, cause she's, you know, she, she's late sixties. Um, but I could see her sort of, cause she, she's, I don't want to say less glamorous cause, um, but she, she just could, I think, roll into being a grandma a very youthful, fun, quirky grandmother quite well. Yeah. So, she's one of my favorite um, actress, older actresses. Yeah. Like, I, I think, I think there's a little bit of math that 
like I said, it would it, it would be a tight fit, but I think she could she could pull it off because she could play a little bit older than uh, than her real age. So so, so that would in be my head oh. for Grandma Lily when I imagine her. It's Blythe Danner. Okay. So I I can see Mary Steeburgen kind of being in that same same little group. I like that. It could so work. you. I like you because what you do is you say, you know what, Hallmark, forget your like little Hallmark budgets. <laughs> we have the bucks. It. Yeah. <laughs> we have HBO money to, uh, to do our casting. So I love it. Uh, but um, no, so, well, heck, I, I, I don't know what Mary Steen married or uh, Dana Delaney would, would, would cost. So they would actually, cause I mean, they both had pretty successful definitely uh, career so they may be out of the out of the budget range um as well but whatever so that's my casting for your your jericho false I, it's funny and i way too lazy to uh, actually look it up but i kept wondering in my head if jericho falls is a real place or not so thank you for clearing that up no it's a fictional little uh at one time gold mining town now tourist trap right so and you know living here in arizona we have a lot of those down there. Mm-hmm. Um, we have Bisbee, we have Jerome. Um, so we have, we have a lot of them. So that's when you're describing it. I was thinking about some of the tombstone. You talk about tombstone, tombstone. in there. Mm-hmm. You know, I've been to tombstone, you know, several times. So I had a very like personal been to those places type feel for what, what that little old mining town, our uh, tourist town really is. So I thought I could uh, really, you know, match it quite well. So. Your last one now. What's your last one? My last one. I did save this for last for a reason because I have a very intentional reason for choosing it. But this is the Pepper Brooks Cozy Mysteries. There are six of them, and these are by Aaron Scott. And Aaron is another one of those authors who have written several series that are this cute, and probably you could pick any of them, but I have a reason. Um, So this story is set around Pepper Brooks, who is an English major at a fictional Northwestern Washington University. Um, It's near, supposedly near Seattle, Washington. And each of these mysteries um, has a literary theme to it, featuring a different classic author. So there's one that's Shakespeare, one that's Hemingway, Jane Austen, and et cetera. And book two in the series I believe is the Shakespeare title. Don't quote me, but I think that's it. And it's called Literally Murder. So I think that needs to be the series. The show series name is Literally Murder. And then you have each one is based on a different um, classic author. Um, And my feeling is that this would be such a fun academia mystery to fit the bill and fill in for those of us who are missing our Mystery 101. Wait, Mystery 101's no longer? I I hadn't heard. (laughs) I'm right, right? I'm right. Yes. Uh, um, But so we get to be on a college campus. We get to do- Sorry, I I just joke because it does not matter what we do are um, on our Instagram. It's just filled. We could be like, what's the weather today where you live? And people will be like, bring back mystery 101. It's so, all, they're just a broken record. Yes, it is. We get a lot of mystery 101 uh, uh, conversation. So, Well, I share because I'm one of the fans who wishes that there were more. So I'm going to recommend that we bring in Pepper Brooks and do these literature mysteries oh. and to fill our need. I've got to interrupt you. Sorry, one second. Going back to your very first or no, your second book, the, um, when we were talking, or was it your first book? The, the, um, Big Shot Mysteries. That was the first one you talked about. So like I say, I didn't get all the way through, but where I did get through, there's the one detective who's like the senior detective who they call the professor. Hmm. So Graham from Mystery 101, I thought there, Ro- Robin, what, what, Robin Thomas. I'm like, that's who they should cast Robin Thomas yes. as, as the professor to bring him back. And he just seemed like that sort of whatever role. So I yeah, forgot, to, I forgot to talk about that. So, so just for everyone knows there's the, the, the Thomas is sort of like the junior detective. Who's the love interest in that triangle, but there's a senior detective who's sort of his mentor. And so that's who I'm talking about. Yeah. And they call yeah. him the professor and professor because I he looks like a professor. He's very, I guess he wears like kind of the tweedy things and Mm -hmm. all that so sorry I I totally distracted because as soon as you're talking about that 
the mystery 101 i just had that flashback getting yeah, back to I'm now glad you mentioned it pepper, yeah getting back to pepper and her uh uh her mysteries yeah so pepper is joined by um hamburger or hammy her boston terrier so we've got a cute pet this is really important in hallmark shows and then a cute boyfriend alex valdez and then um a quirky fun roommate olivia and olivia and alex play big parts in each of the each of the shows they're recurring characters so, for- sorry is she in is she a student then yes pepper and olivia mm-hmm. okay. so those are uh that's the setup for pepper brooks cozy mysteries that i think we retitle literally murder i love it and for the pepper brooks character i am gonna pick bailey madison she's from good witch and original sin i like her a lot i've liked her in in things that i've seen her in otherwise too i think she's done some hallmark shows hasn't she eric um well i know she's done good witch I don't, she's got to have been in something else, but she's, yes. you know, up until recently, she's been too young really to be mm-hmm. like a love interest, but you're, she's perfect age for yeah. this. So that's, I think that's, by the way, when I, when I saw that, I was like, darn it, man, I should have, uh, but she's too young for any of the, any of the roles I had. I love yeah. her. Yeah. And that's the other, like, you know, I mentioned in, when we talked about Gemma Doyle, she's a little bit older of a sleuth, right. which is fun because we don't see that a lot. But this one is a little younger because they're in college. So we can go a little bit younger with our picks. Um, And then for Alex Valdez, I didn't pick an Olivia. I don't have a feel for Olivia, but Alex Valdez is Diego Tinoco in my mind. He's from On the Block or Knights of Zodiac. Um, I think he's just perfect for it. And he's super cute. So do you know who I think would be great for the Olivia? Um, Olivia, even though I haven't read it is Olivia Steele Falconer. She was the daughter for um, Benjamin Ayers, Drew Godfrey character in uh, the Chronicle Mysteries. And I was, she was like really great. And for me, whenever there's teenagers in, or kids in general in Hallmark movies, it's usually like a red flag because they so rarely get it right. And she was one of the ones who I thought was great. And it's kind of like with, with Bailey, who's kind of was too young really to, Mm-hmm. sort of take on um sort of another role but now she is you know a few years later so I think she would be perfect as like a college roommate now granted I don't know Olivia's character but I would just love to see her oh her name's Olivia anyhow right I know so, she wouldn't even have to learn a new name for her perfect role. it makes it easy easy for her but yeah I'd love to see her in, in another role um and that's also one of the things with Good Witch I really liked because I thought the teenagers in that were, were mm-hmm. great I like Bailey and um I don't know what the kids her uh uh James Denton's car- kids I forget what his name was but I thought they both did a really good job um yeah and so I, I, agree. I love Bailey sometimes they when you get the teenagers wrong it's really glaring but I think it's getting better and better like I think about who they cast for teenagers when we were young Eric watching shows and they were like 35 year olds apparently going <laughs> to high school yeah yeah that's a good point at least that doesn't happen anymore well, I think so. with this Piper Brooks, this is uh, one where you do have obviously get these up and comers because mm-hmm. they're so they're you know college age kids, so you need that. You can't have the you know the uh, Nikki Deloach or something like that who oh. typically the typical Hallmark sleuth and stuff. So I love it. Uh, you know, I, lo- I really also like because that's one of the things I really enjoyed about the um, Aurora Tea Garden when they did the prequel with Skylar Samuels and they sort of went back to her being in grad school and this the younger version because you know with some of these and and I you know it's going to border in ageism but I'm 55 so I can you know whatever I'm talking about myself but it just gets to a point where you, you do need younger because this the storylines to have these these you know romantic romantic triangles going on or things like that as you get into your 50s which is going to be ironic considering what I'm about to talk about but it just you know it's it doesn't quite make sense right so you do need to have some more youthful and I like this because you're you're going young so you can have like 10 years of you know if they do a mystery a year you could have like 10 years of it and they still will be in a good age you know they'll only be like mid-30s and so it's still 
the life the life circumstances for a lot of the plots still totally make sense. And exactly. I know it's Hallmark World, so they don't have to make sense as we're talking about. We have people in their 30s who are always like the junior executive, where if you're really in your 30s and being the junior executive, oh, dogs are going crazy. But if you're really in your 30s and being the junior executive, probably, you know, you missed the boat there, but whatever. <laughs> All right. As I was just talking about ages and I said, you need to have youthful. My last one is a British mystery that's already been turned into a British um, cozy mystery on Acorn. And that's Agatha Raisin. <clears throat> and when we did our um, British mysteries that we'd love to see turn into Hallmark, I talked about this, but I'm going to talk about the book. So the book and the, um, the movies, they actually do as I was saying earlier, how a lot of the times with Hallmark, they don't follow the the book very closely. In the Agatha Raisin, at least with the acorns, they do follow it pretty close. Like they figure out what are all the major um, milestones and they hit them. They, you know, they have to condense some things, but for the most part, they stick pretty true to the path of the book. Um, but this was written by M.C. Beaton, I believe the name is. And then the last couple, there's a, there's 38 of them, 34 of them, excuse me. Um, uh, the, the writer has since died and her um, friend took over or her maybe her mentee or something like that took over and has written the last uh, three, I believe it is, or four of them. But um, with this, the reason why I kind of like this one and I put it last is obviously it's already been made. And so anyone who has a corn who's watched is going to have like, Oh, I know who this character is. So it's always hard to recast, but they did it in like, you know, a lot of shows like the office, they recast that. And it was very successful over here with, you know, Ricky Gervais and, and Michael Scott or Michael Scott's um, Steve uh, Carell, obviously are very different, but you know, they were able to recast it and make it very enduring. But the thing I like about this is kind of like we just talked about. It is, basically around this woman, Agatha Raisin, who's in her 50s, who basically had spent her whole life just focusing on work. She's not very likable. And she owned a PR firm. And she just really drove it hard and lived in London was just the epitome of sort of the big city person who just was rude. I'm going to do what I want. And then she ends up in, like I said, around 55, I think, um, deciding, okay, I've made all my money. She always had this like ideal. Like she she came from very poor uh, uh, background and was self-made. And she always had this ideal thing of the Cotswolds, I believe it's what it's called, of, and like, I'm going to retire there. And it's like small town, England. And, you know, it's about two hours outside of London, I believe, from how they describe it by train or car, however you're getting there. And so she decides she's retiring there. And so it's going to like the small town and she's this big brash woman who's coming in there and doesn't know how to interact with the small town, you know, community. And we've just talked about that in all these mysteries. A lot of them are basically around yeah. small town. So even, even the Sherlock Holmes one, which is Boston, but it's Cape Cod, you know, it's mm -hmm. West London. So it's not Boston per se, even though it's adjacent. And so this really is, they take them in there in this, and so she's adjusting. And at first she's just trying to steamroll all these people. She's not happy. She's like, I you know they're all being way too friendly. I'm put off. And she's also the one who does not have a filter. And in the books, it's kind of hard where she's definitely more unlikable in the books. Um, the books are also, in my opinion, a little bit, there's a lot of little datedness in them where, um, you know, look at it through a 2023 lens. They're not that old. I think they're like from the early nineties, but um, it's definitely looking at it through a 2023 lens. You're like, uh, can't really do that now. But when you look at how they adjusted it for the acorn series, you can definitely adapt. And I think with the books, um, there, like I say, there's 34 of them. So you can keep going. Um, I just really like, the way that Agatha, so basically the first one is Agatha is in this, she moves to the, the small town and she's trying to adapt and they're having a quiche contest. And so Agatha is like, well, I don't know how to cook, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to this great 
I guess there's like key stores in England mm -hmm. and buy this like from the best key store, buy this quiche, put my name on it and enter the contest and I'm sure to win. And so she does that. She ends up not winning because the winner was this woman who was had some sort of relationship with the judge guy. And um, so they were kind of, even though he was married, they kind of had a little, little thing on the side and um, lo and behold. So she's all like, how did I not win? And of course he ends up dead and she's the first suspect. And so basically as she's trying to clear her name, it comes out that she indeed bought her quiche. And <laughs> when you're in a little town and you buy your quiche, that does not, that's like more of a, of, a, a, of, you know, a horror than the murder basically of cheating in the quiche contest. And so, you know, a lot of it is about her adapting and trying to settle into the community and her just uh, learning how to be around people who are nice and her to like somewhat soften up. And then there's a love interest of which in the books is not very healthy because Agatha very much, um, sort of gives up herself and even though she's never cared about love she was married to a guy for a very short time when she was very young who turned out to be an alcoholic and she just left him and so she hadn't seen him in years and years and she just assumed he was dead and moved on and hadn't seen him in like 30s 40 years whatever so 30 years but then there's miss uh james lacy who's her next door neighbor who she becomes just like basically in love with the idea of love and he's not very, he's very British. So he's like very proper. And so he's just all the things that she does to try to please him. Um, he kind of are like, oh, you know, you can't do it. But in the mo in the movie in Acorn, they basically, and I think Ashley Jensen is the, the actress who plays her does a fantastic job. And I think it's a little easier to take the words when, and it's kind of like with, you know, with your book, when you see Chloe sometimes and you read it, it's very, you're reading it and you're putting everything in your own brain and you're like creating that, that situation. Whereas when it's on the screen, you have someone else who's acting it. And so she's able to Ashley Jensen's take this, like, gruff character who you at first you you would like in the book you just don't like her a lot but mm -hmm. do it in a way that kind of can be endearing and with her inflection of her voice or like her mannerisms it's you kind of chuckle at it and you it's not as off-putting as it is in the book i think that would be very very key to turning this book in but the mysteries are all really they're fantastic cozy mysteries um like I say, and there's an abundance of them it's kind of like you were talking about, um, you know, you, you have this steady stream of characters who come yeah. through. Some of them are local. Like, I'm not sure I'd want to live there because a lot of people do die for being in a little town, which are most of these, you know, kind of like Aurora Tea Garden, how many people she discovers dead. Like, I would not want to be her friend. But um, just in general, it's just, it's a really good series. I think they they go in a bunch of different directions. And then just the, the ensemble cast is also fantastic in this um so i think it just gives a lot of um depth to it to be able to make a series of them because you know that's one of the things like when you do have you know just the limited uh two characters and main characters it kind of i don't want to say it becomes repetitive but when you just have this nice big bevy of characters it just makes it i think a little bit more fun because you sometimes you know one character may have a really big role and the next one you don't really see much of them and uh, it just keeps things fresh and, and uh, like I say, especially if you want to have a bunch of them. So this is one though that you have read some of, right? I've read, um, I've read some and I've seen the Acorn production and I, you know, I would agree with everything you said. I think that the, um, the Acorn shows I, I did find myself laughing and finding the books funny, but I really found them funny on screen. Right. And I think that's part of what helps make her more likable is because she's also a little bit, she's funny and she, you laugh at her, you know, she's almost that hot mess thing that we talked right. about from your, um, from your earlier pick. And, uh, and so I found that, that I, I did like her and I thought I found the scenarios funny, which is a very like British cozy feel 
you know, that, you know, and the, um, a lot of stereotypes with the, the preacher and his wife and that, you know, I love those like English stereotypes that we get to see too. So I think it'd be great. I think it'd be a lot of fun. So I'm going to go over there's, there's from the main characters, there's Agatha Raisin, who I've talked about. Then there's James Lacey, who he's a retired British colonel who's sitting there and he's wanting to write his, this book on some old British military history. And so he's always working on that. Um, there's Bill Wong, who's the uh, constable, who is in the book, very different than in in the, the movie. In the book, they describe him as being this Buddha-esque looking body. And in, in the in the acorn production, he's, you know, a fit trim guy, but he's a younger guy who in the beginning of the series, he's got a crush on Agatha who is older than him. And then Royal Silver is her old assistant who um, is back in London, but he keeps coming out. He's a very flamboyant gay guy who is just kind of, Whenever she, she should have somebody who like maybe keeps her in line, it's not Roy Silver because he'll push her, you know, to do the crazy thing rather than keeping her out. It's like the, you know, the thing of like, oh, you know, who's your best friend who's going to uh, keep you out of trouble versus your best friend who's going to be there sitting next to you in the jail cell. He's going to be the one who's next to her in the jail cell. And in the book, though, where it's different is there's a little more antagonistic role between him and her. but. The other thing is what's interesting in, in the book is she never had friends. So she was just all about her business. And Roy Silver was just happened to be a guy who worked there who didn't particularly like her. They sort of through, I think, using each other, had this relationship in the book. Whereas in the Acorn production, they're a little more, it does start out there, but they're definitely more friendly, I think, which lends itself, I think, more for the cozy mystery. And then while there's, a, like I said, there's a whole bunch of characters. I have Sarah, Sarah Bloxy, who is the vicar's wife, and she is a big role in the acorn. But she also in the book, she's kind of, I would say, Agatha's best friend who turns into her best friend because she's just the one person who is kind of like your Brie, right? But in a little more mature way because she's whatever, a vicar's wife, and she's British. But she's just very optimistic. She sees the good in almost everybody. She sort of, when uh, Agatha has these moral dilemmas and she can always think, you know, what would Sarah do? And Sarah's kind of like a guiding force for her. And then in, in this Acorn series, she, with each season, gets a bigger and bigger role. She helps Agatha and figure out how to live in this small town. Yes. She's like that... She's that uh, guiding light for her a little bit. I like that character. And Agatha early on is not particularly, well, she's not particularly nice to anybody, but she's not particularly nice to to her, but she's patient enough to sort of win her over and mm -hmm. becomes a very much, I would say, liked by Agatha. So that's sort of the core group of of characters that I focused on for this. And I had the hardest time getting Agatha because I could not get Ashley Jensen out of my head, right? And while I say, let's just bring her over and have her continue it, I did want to Americanize it, right? So we're not, instead of being over in London, leaving London and going to, you know, Cotsworth, we're kind of doing the more like we're in some bigger city, New York, and going out to some upstate New York kind of place or something like that or Boston and going out to Amherst or you know one of the one of the things like that so I, I did Americanize it rather than trying to keep it in a British location because also Hallmark why they I think they could do is you know a mystery here and there they could never sustain I guess I had a little realism there they could never sustain an abroad mystery of uh you know doing it pretty much anything out of Malta it seems but um so for Agatha I have, and it came to me this morning. I had so many, like, as I was going through, I had one person, then I changed it, then another one, then another one. And then just came to me this morning while I was walking my dogs, but, and I, I probably will pronounce her name terrible at the beginning, but Malara Harden, she's from the office. She was at Love Classified. And part of the reason why is 
I think she just brings that sort of can be very curt, but somehow likable. To me, she was just perfect. Now, did you did you go through and give the any of these some thought? I didn't, but I I like this because, and I don't I had this I don't mean this in a bad way, but she could almost be her character from The Office. Remember, right. um, I Michael's girlfriend, right? And she was his boss, and. And so you can really imagine her being that person who is just all business and, but yet you like her and she's going to grow on you. And she can also be funny. Clearly she played in a comedy for how many years? So I think that that, um, I think it's a great pick and she's exactly the right age group. Right. And that's the thing of trying to find, I had some, and once again, it's Hallmark. We can adjust up and down if we need to. She's exactly the same age. So, um, which is exactly the same age as me too. It just that came to me. And then when I looked up how old she was, I was like, oh, perfect. This is awesome. I loved it. Because yeah, she, I mean, just quite frankly, she she can pull off bitchy very well. And that's kind of Agatha. But she's endearing. And she, you know, it's kind of like your, your, you know, your Chloe is you realize that one of the things with with Agatha too is she has this very gruff, I'm business, but you know, exterior, but you realize what it is. And they explain and they explain this in the books. It's because she had this very poor upbringing, mm-hmm. and so she was always felt like she was not good enough. So even when she was, you know, running this major PR and she had you know all the money she could need, she always still felt like the outsider. She was not part of the you know the fancy people, and so that is a big thing of her insecurities that do drive her. And, you know, we were talking before with Chloe, how she gets in her own way. That's a big part of what gets in, you know, Agatha's way is this young, deep rooted insecurities. And she never had love. Her parents were not very loving her first, you know, her husband of, I think he was only her husband for a few months. Um, You turned into, you know, the raging alcoholic. He was, you know, not loving. So she never really had love and never sought it. So she doesn't really know how to deal with it and like i say she has this this very unrealistic expectation of what it is in the movie in the acorn i think she's a little bit better um well she's a lot better i should say because in in the book she's a sometimes darn right god awful horrible my james lacy who's the neighbor the the military retiree that one I actually came to pretty easy for me. And that was James Denton. You know, we're talking a little uh, uh, good wife or good witch, excuse me. He was, you know, her husband um, in that. He also was in several different Hallmark movies. I just thought he he was perfect for, for it. He's a little bit older than her, but he just has that sort of, I could have been a retired, you know, Colonel feel to him um he's also got a little bit of a charm in the book he's not very charming he's very stoic and like stiff upper lip kind of guy whereas definitely james lacy in the movies is is definitely a softer character everyone in the in the in 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 the acorns are softer characters but i went with james denton for for james lacy what do you think of that i like it a lot that's who i like like erect tall thin and skinny like military man. Yeah. Right, right. Exactly. Perfect. Okay. Sarah Bloxby, um, the vicar's wife, who, as I said, is that sort of moral compass, but at the same time, she's also funny in kind of a disarming, nice way. So she's not like rip roaring funny, but she's just very fun. And so for that one, I went with Kate Drummond, who was in in the flower shop mysteries. She was Nikki, who was Abby's best friend. And I just thought she would be perfect in that role of just sort of being that moral compass and still funny and likable character with that. And I just want to see, I, I loved her in, in Flower Shop Mysteries and want to see her back in Hallmark. So I thought this would be a perfect role for her. I think she's really a good pick because she's like, she's soft, you know, like she, it can be like a soft-spoken kind of a person. And that's kind of how I imagine that character. And I also think she's like so pretty that she's the 
kind of pretty that you don't have to put any makeup on really, you know, or she would appear to be like fresh faced, which also I think that the vicar's wife is just like such a natural kind of a woman. So I like that. Bill Wong was a tough one. And partly because I'm torn between the book, the Buddha-esque Bill Wong, and then the acorn Bill Wong. And um, I ended up staying with the acorn one because once again, we're making movies and with movies, you got to be more charming. And so I, I went with that. I, I gave in and I went with Shannon Cook. I, I believe that's how you pronounce his last name. He was um, in my, was it Big Fat Christmas Family or something like that, the, the, the um, holiday movie last year. He just is a good looking, charming, got a great smile and that he, uh, I, I thought he would just be good. He's in the right age group. I just had this vision of him, you know, having the crush on, uh, on Malora or however you pronounce her name. I thought he could do that just wonderfully. And, and, uh, like I said, he was, he was great. So I'd love to see him back again. And I say, it gives us a little bit of diversity in that. I like that too. And another idea I have for him, cause I'm with you. I think, I think I would go with more of the acorn uh, characterization. I also like Henry Golding. Okay. He was from, I believe, Crazy Rich Asians. Yes. And he was in Snake Eyes. A lot of times he plays a bad guy, but I would love to see him in this role. Yeah, you got it. Like you love when the bad guys are, you know, turn out to be good people in some of the stuff you see their, their range and stuff. So that's a good one. That's a very good one. My last character, and this is one like kind of like J.C. Doton, who I just really like, always in a supporting role, but can never get enough of him. And whenever he's on screen, he's always just knocks it out of the park. And so for Roy Silver, I have Maddie Finoricci, Finoricho, however you pronounce his last name. He um, he was in the Holiday Sitter. I think he was the brother, if I'm not mistaken, or cousin. I forget where he was. He was in Welcome to Mama's. He was, you know, worked at the restaurant there. He uh, was in The Perfect Kiss. So he's just always like, you know, that secondary character, mm -hmm. you know, and part of it is he just has that sort of like good angular face because Roy has just like a, a sharp wit to him and I just think he could pull that off just marvelously. I think this is right up his alley. I think he's a great pick, Eric. I think he would pull it off. And I think that that is more realistic. But since I've been doing these knock it out of the park picks the whole day, um, I'm going to just throw in Zachary Quinto as a, as a uh, okay. suggestion. Let's just go for another big name, but it's the same. Honestly, I see them kind of similarly, like you say, like they're the angular face that they, and they can be really um, over the top funny and just take that role all the way. You know, it's a snark. That's what it is. He's like snark. He can be snarky. He can be snarky and that's what we need. Right. All right. There we go. Um, we, we, we talked about a lot of them. I hopefully uh, people listening, listen to them. And if they, uh, probably you know the chance of these becoming hallmark movies you know i like to say uh we have a lot of influence over there but the reality is maybe we don't if, but regardless these are ones that we think could really be great hallmark uh, movies but in the meantime we would highly recommend that you go ahead and whether you do an audible of them or you you know go ahead and you know do the old paperback and read it would recommend it regardless of if it hits the uh like not the big screen, I guess the small screen. Is that what we call TV, I guess? You know, whether it becomes a movie or not, I think they're really enjoyable books to uh, to to give a read to as well. Absolutely. Give them a shot. I think you'll you'll like them all. All right. All right. So I'm going to put you in the spot here. Of all the ones we talked about, what's the one character that you think we nailed? And you can pick your own. Don't You don't have to be modest. What's the one character you think we we totally nailed the most? Well, I'm going to have to just make it easy because I'm so excited about Travis Van Winkle being Chief Garner. I just think that is just perfect, Eric. I agree with you. And once again, I'm being, I'm being uh, selfish, but I, like I said, I, he is it. And how, how he was not in your head when he had to be subconsciously 
what was it? The Mary, Mary all the way or whatever. I forget what the one with him and Rachel Lee Cook, the Christmas movie. You had to have like just watched that or something like that when you started writing and subconsciously you wrote it. You, you, you're unaware, but you had just watched that. And so there you go. That had to be it. And now I want to go watch one of his movies. <laughs> well, moving on. So why don't you tell people um, how they can find you, all the different places they are to follow you. I uh, I, I enjoy following you um, to share with them. Yeah. So you can find out all about me, my books and the podcast um, at my website, which is just brookpetersonauthor.com. Uh, and then I'm most active on social media on Facebook and Instagram. And I'm just at Brooke Peterson author, both of those places. And then your podcast is called what again? Clued in mystery. And it's available on any of the, your favorite apps. So we're on Apple and Google and Spotify and all over the place. You can also just go to our website and listen there, which is cluedinmystery.com. Okay. And every Tuesday, but you're on hiatus. When are you coming back? We are coming back. Our first episode uh, releases that first week of September, and we're going to be talking about our summer reading, what we read over the summer and kind of give some um, book recommendations. All right. Just one little tiny hint. What was one thing you've read this summer? Oh, I read Murder Your Employer. And Murder, it was so good. Yeah. Murder Your Employer? It's really good. I would say it is like Lemony Snickets for adults. It's like this oh whole tongue in cheek thing. The premise is that you uh, go to this special university to learn how to take out that one person in your life that doesn't need to be around anymore. It's great. Awesome. All right. We'll have to look forward to that one. So, okay. Well, thank you very much for being on. Um, I wish you a great rest of your day. Happy sleuthing reading. I don't know what we call, uh, what we call it, but um, enjoy all of yours. And I can't wait to listen to that, that podcast where you break down those, that summer reading that looks, sounds awesome. Thank you so much for having me on. It was a pleasure. I hope we can do it again sometime. Maybe we'll host you next time, Eric. That'd be great. Thanks for All right. Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.